Friday, March 19th, 1943. Dearest Kitty, in less than an hour, joy was followed by disappointment. Turkey hasn't entered the war yet. It was only a cabinet minister talking about Turkey giving up its neutrality sometime soon. The newspaper fender in Dam Square was shouting, Turkey on England's side, and the papers were being snatched out of his hands. This was how we'd heard the encouraging rumor. Thousand gilded notes are being declared invalid. That will be a blow to the black marketeers and others like them, but even more to people in hiding and anyone else with money that can't be accounted for. To turn in a thousand gilded bill, you have to be able to state how you came by it and provide proof. They can still be used to pay taxes, but only until next week. The five hundred notes will lapse at the same time. Geese and Co. still had some unaccounted for thousand gilded bills, which they used to pay their estimated taxes for the coming years. So everything seems to be overboard. Duso has received an old-fashioned foot-operated dentist drill. That means I'll probably be getting a thorough checkup soon. Duso is terribly lax when it comes to obeying the rules of the house. Not only does he write letters to his Charlotte. He's also carrying on a chatty correspondence with various other people. Market, the annexist Dutch teacher, has been correcting these letters for him. Father has forbidden him to keep up the practice, and Market has stopped correcting letters. But I think it won't be long before he starts up again. The Führer has been talking to wounded soldiers. We listened on the radio, and it was pathetic. The questions and answers went something like this: My name is Heinrich Schäpel. Where were you wounded? Near Stalingrad. What kind of wound is it? Two frostbitten feet and a fracture of the left arm. This is an exact report of the hideous puppet show aired on the radio. The wounded seem proud of their wounds. The more, the better. One was so beside himself at the thought of shaking hands with the Führer that he could barely say a word. I happened to drop Duso soap on the floor and step on it. Now there's a whole piece missing. I've already asked father to compensate him for the mother, father, Margaret, and I were sitting quite pleasantly together last night when Peter suddenly came in and whispered in father's ear. I caught the words "a barrel falling over in the warehouse" and someone fiddling with the door. Margaret heard it too, but was trying to calm me down since I turned white as chalk and was extremely nervous. The three of us waited while father and Peter went downstairs. A minute or two later, Mrs. Van Dan came up with where she'd been listening to the radio and told us that Pim had asked her to turn it off and tiptoe upstairs. But you know what happens when you are trying to be quiet. The old stairs creaked twice as loud. Five minutes later, Peter and Pim, the colour drained from their faces, appeared again to relate their experiences. They had positioned themselves under the staircase and waited. Nothing happened. Then all of a sudden, they heard a couple of bangs, as if two doors had been slammed shut inside the house. Pim bounded up the stairs, while Peter went to warn Duso, who finally presented himself upstairs, though not without kicking up a fuss and making a lot of noise. Then we all tiptoed in our stockinged feet to the Van Dans to the next floor. Mister Van D had a bad cold and had already gone to bed. So we gathered around his bedside and discussed our suspicions in a whisper. Every time Mister Van D coughed loudly, Missus Van D and I nearly had a nervous fit. He kept coughing until someone came up with the bright idea of giving him codeine. His cough subsided immediately. Once again, we waited and waited, but heard nothing. Finally, we came to the conclusion that the burglars had taken to their heels when they heard footsteps in an otherwise quiet building. The problem now was that the chairs in the private office were neatly grouped around the radio, which was tuned to England. If the burglars had forced the door and the air raid wardens were to notice it and call the police, that could be very serious repercussions. So Mr. Van Dan got up, pulled on his coat and pants, put on his hat, and cautiously followed Father down the stairs, with Peter right behind him. The ladies waited in suspense until the men returned five minutes later and reported that there was no sign of any activity in the building. We agreed not to run any water or flush the toilet, but since everyone's stomach was churning from all the tension, you can imagine the stench after we each had a turn in the bath.
Incidents like these are always accompanied by other disasters, and this was no exception. Number one, the Western Toran bells stopped chiming, and I'd always found them so comforting. Number two, Mr. Foskajol left early last night. And we weren't sure if he'd given Beb the key and she'd forgotten to lock the door, but that was of little importance now. The night had just begun, and we still weren't sure what to expect. We were somewhat reassured by the fact that between eight fifteen, when the burglar had first entered the building and put our lives in jeopardy, and ten thirty, we hadn't heard a sound. The more we thought about it, the less likely it seemed that a burglar would have forced the door so early in the evening. When there were still people out on the streets, besides that, it occurred to us that the warehouse manager at the cat company next door might still have been at work. What with the excitement and the thin walls, it's easy to mistake the sounds. Besides, your imagination often plays tricks on you in moments of danger. So we went to bed, though not to sleep. Father and mother and Mister Duso were awake most of the night. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that I hardly got a wink of sleep. This morning, the men went downstairs to see if the outside door was still locked, but all was well. Of course, we gave the entire office staff a blow-by-blow account of the incident, which had been far from pleasant. It's much easier to laugh at these kinds of things after they've happened, and Beth was the only one who took us seriously. Yours, Anne. P.S. This morning, the toilet was clogged. And father had to stick in a long wooden pole and fish out several pounds of excrement and strawberry recipes. Afterward, he burned the pole. Saturday, March twenty-seven, nineteen forty-three. Dearest Kitty, we've finished our shorthand course and are now working on improving our speed. Aren't we smart? Let me tell you more about my time killers. I adore mythology, especially the Greek and Roman gods. Everyone here thinks my interest is just a passing fancy. Since they've never heard of a teenager with an appreciation of mythology, well then, I guess I'm the first. Mister Van Dam has a cold, or rather, he has a scratchy throat, but he's making an enormous to do over it. He gargles with chamomile tea, coats the roof of his mouth with a tincture of myrrh, and rubs mantelatum over his chest, nose, gums, and tongue. And to top it off, he's in a foul mood. Rather, some German bigwig. Recently gave a speech. All Jews must be out of the German-occupied territories before July first. The province of Utrecht will be cleansed of Jews between April first and May first, and the provinces of North and South Holland between May first and June first. These poor people are being shipped off to filthy slaughterhouses like a herd of sick and neglected cattle. But I'll say no more on the subject. My own thoughts give me nightmares. One good piece of news is that the labor exchange was set on fire in an act of sabotage. A few days later, the county clerk's office also went up in flames. Men posing as German police bound and gagged the guards and managed to destroy some important documents. Yours, Ann. Thursday, April first, nineteen forty-three. Dearest Kitty, I'm not really in the mood for pranks. On the contrary, today I can safely quote the saying: "Misfortunes never come singly." First, Mr. Clayman, our merry sunshine, had another bout of gastrointestinal hemorrhaging yesterday, and will have to stay in bed for at least three weeks. I should tell you that his stomach has been bothering him quite a bit, and there's no cure. Second, Beb has the flu. Third, Mr. Foskajol has to go to the hospital next week. He probably has an ulcer and will have to undergo surgery. Fourth, the managers of Pomerson Industries came from Frankfurt to discuss the new Opacta deliveries. Father had gone through the important points with Mr. Clayman, and there wasn't enough time to give Mr. Kugler a thorough briefing. The gentleman arrived from Frankfurt, and Father was already shaking at the thought of how the talks would go. If only I could be there! If only I were downstairs! He exclaimed. Go lie down with your ear to the floor. They'll be brought to the private office. And you'll be able to hear everything. Father's face cleared, and yesterday morning at ten thirty, Margaret and Pym took up their posts at the floor. By noon, the talks weren't finished, but Father was in no shape to continue his listening campaign. He was in agony from having to lie for hours in such an unusual and uncomfortable position. At two thirty, we heard voices in the hall, and I took his place. Margaret kept me company. 
The conversation was so long-winded and boring that I suddenly fell asleep on the cold, hard linoleum. Margaret didn't dare touch me for fear they'd hear us, and of course she couldn't shut. I slept for a good half hour and then awoke with a start, having forgotten every word of the important discussion. Luckily, Margaret had paid more attention. Yours, Anne. Friday, April second, nineteen forty-three. Dearest Kitty, oh my! Another item has been added to my list of sins. Last night, I was lying in bed, waiting for Father to tuck me in and say my prayers with me. When Mother came into the room, sat on my bed, and asked very gently, "Anne." Daddy isn't ready. How about if I listen to your prayers tonight? No, Mumsy, I replied. Mother got up, stood beside my bed for a moment, and then slowly walked toward the door. Suddenly, she turned, her face contorted with pain, and said, "I don't want to be angry with you. I can't make you love me." A few tears slid down her cheeks as she went out the door. I lay still, thinking how mean it was of me to reject her so cruelly. But I also knew that I was incapable of answering her any other way. I can't be a hypocrite and pray with her when I don't feel like it. It just doesn't work that way. I felt sorry for Mother, very, very sorry, because for the first time in my life, I noticed she wasn't indifferent to my coldness. I saw the sorrow in her face when she talked about not being able to make me love her. It's hard to tell the truth, and yet the truth is that she's the one who's rejected me. She's the one whose tactless comments and cruel jokes about matters I don't think are funny have made me insensitive to any sign of love on her part. Just as my heart sinks every time I hear her harsh words, that's how her heart sank when she realized there was no more love between us. She cried half the night and didn't get any sleep. Father has avoided looking at me, and if his eyes do happen to cross mine, I can read his unspoken words. How can you be so unkind? How dare you make your mother so sad? Everyone expects me to apologize, but this is not something I can apologize for, because I told the truth. And sooner or later, mother was bound to find out anyway. I seem to be indifferent to mother's tears and father's glances, and I am, because both of them are now feeling what I've always felt. I can always feel sorry for mother, who will have to figure out what her attitude should be all by herself. For my part. I will continue to remain silent and aloof, and I don't intend to shrink from the truth, because the longer it's postponed, the harder it will be for them to accept it when they do hear it. Yours, Anne. Tuesday, April twenty seventh, nineteen forty three. Dearest Kitty, the house is still trembling from the after effects of the quarrels. Everyone is mad at everyone else. Mother and I, Mister Van Dan and Father, Mother and Missus Van D. Terrific atmosphere, don't you think? Once again, Anne's usual list of shortcomings has been extensively aired. Our German visitors were back last Saturday. They stayed until six. We all sat upstairs, not daring to move an inch. If there's no one else working in the building or in the neighborhood, you can hear every single step in the private office. I've got ants in my pants again from having to sit still so long. Mister Foskerjo has been hospitalized. But Mr. Clayman's back at the office. His stomach stopped bleeding sooner than it normally does. He told us that the county clerk's office took an extra beating because the firemen flooded the entire building instead of just putting out the fire. That does my heart good. The Carlton Hotel has been destroyed. Two British planes loaded with fire bombs landed right on top of the German officers' club. The entire corner of Fischerstraße and Single has gone up in flames. The number of airstrikes on German cities is increasing daily. We haven't had a good night's rest in ages, and I have bags under my eyes from lack of sleep. Our food is terrible. Breakfast consists of plain, unbuttered bread and ersatz coffee. For the last two weeks, lunch has been spinach or cooked lettuce with huge potatoes that have a rotten, sweetish taste. If you're trying to diet, the annex is the place to be. Upstairs, they complain bitterly. But we don't think it's such a tragedy. All the Dutchmen who either fought or were mobilized in 1940 have been called up to work in prisoner of war camps. I bet they're taking this precaution because of the invasion. Yours, Anne. Saturday, May 1st, 1943. Dearest Kitty, yesterday was Dussel's birthday. At first, he acted as if he didn't want to celebrate it. But when Meep arrived with a large shopping bag overflowing with gifts, he was as excited as a little kid. 
His darling Losh has sent him eggs, butter, cookies, lemonade, bread, cognac, spice cake, flowers, oranges, chocolate, books, and writing paper. He piled his presents on the table and displayed them for no fewer than three days. The silly old goat! You mustn't get the idea that he's starving. We found bread, cheese, jam, and eggs in his cupboard. It's absolutely disgraceful that do so, whom we've treated with such kindness and whom we took in to save from destruction. Should stuff himself behind our backs and not give us anything. After all, we've shared all we had with him. But what's worse, in our opinion, is that he's so stingy with respect to Mr. Clayman, Mr. Foskajol, and Beb. He doesn't give them a thing. In Dussel's view, the oranges that Clayman so badly needs for his sick stomach will benefit his own stomach even more. Tonight the guns have been banging away so much that I've already had to gather up my belongings four times. Today I packed a suitcase with the stuff I need in case we had to flee. But as Mother correctly noted, where would you go? All of Holland is being punished for the workers' strikes. Martial law has been declared, and everyone is going to get one less butter coupon. What naughty children! I wash Mother's hair this evening, which is no easy task these days. We have to use a very sticky liquid cleanser because there's no more shampoo. Besides that. Mum has had a hard time combing her hair because the family comb has only ten teeth left. Yours, Anne. Sunday, May second, nineteen forty-three. When I think about our lives here, I usually come to the conclusion that we live in a paradise compared to the Jews who aren't in hiding. All the same, later on, when everything has returned to normal, I'll probably wonder how we, who always lived in such comfortable circumstances, could have sunk so low. With respect to manners, I mean. For example, the same oilcloth has covered the dining table ever since we've been here. After so much use, it's hardly what you'd call spotless. I do my best to clean it, but since the dishcloth was also purchased before we went into hiding and consists of more holes than cloth, it's a thankless task. The Van Dans have been sleeping all winter long on the same flannel sheet, which can't be washed because detergent is rationed and in short supply. Besides. It's of such poor quality that it's practically useless. Father is walking around in frayed trousers, and his tie is also showing signs of wear and tear. Mama's corset snapped today and is beyond repair, while Margaret is wearing a bra that's two sizes too small. Mother and Margaret have shared the same three undershorts the entire winter, and mine are so small they don't even cover my stomach. These are all things that can be overcome. But I sometimes wonder how can we, whose every possession, from my underpants to father's shaving brush, is so old and worn, ever hope to regain the position we had before the war? Sunday, May second, nineteen forty-three. The attitude of the annex residents toward the war. Mr. Van Dam, in the opinion of us all, this revered gentleman has great insight into politics. Nevertheless, he predicts we'll have to stay here until the end of nineteen forty-three. That's a very long time, and yet it's possible to hold out until then. But who can assure us that this war, which has caused nothing but pain and sorrow, will then be over, and that nothing will have happened to us and our helpers long before that time? No one. That's why each and every day is filled with tension. Expectation and hope generate tension, as does fear. For example, when we hear a noise inside or outside the house. Or when we read new proclamations in the paper, since we're afraid our helpers might be forced to go into hiding themselves sometime. These days, everyone is talking about having to hide. We don't know how many people are actually in hiding. Of course, the number is relatively small compared to the general population. But later on, we'll no doubt be astonished at how many good people in Holland were willing to take Jews and Christians, with or without money, into their homes. There are also an unbelievable number of people with false identity papers. Mrs. Van Dam, when this beautiful damsel heard that it was getting easier these days to obtain false IDs, she immediately proposed that we each have one made, as if there were nothing to it, as if Father and Mr. Van Dam were made of money. Mrs. Van Dam is always saying the most ridiculous things, and her manner is often exasperated. But that's not surprising, because one day Curly announces, "When this is all over, I'm going to have myself baptized." And the next, as long as I can remember, I've wanted to go to Jerusalem.
I only feel at home with other Jews. Pim is a big optimist, but he always has his reasons. Mr. Dusso makes up everything as he goes along, and anyone wishing to contradict His Majesty had better think twice. In Alfred Dusso's home, his word is law, but that doesn't suit Anne Frank in the least. What the other members of the Annex family think about the war doesn't matter. When it comes to politics, these four are the only ones who count. Actually, only two of them do. But Madame Van Dan and Dusso include themselves as well. Tuesday, May eighteenth, nineteen forty-three. Dearest Kitty, I recently witnessed a fierce dogfight between German and English pilots. Unfortunately, a couple of Allied airmen had to jump out of their burning plane. Our milkman, who lives in Halfwick, saw four Canadians sitting along the side of the road, and one of them spoke fluent Dutch. He asked the milkman if he had a light for a cigarette. And then told him the crew had consisted of six men. The pilot had been burned to death, and the fifth crew member had hidden himself somewhere. The German security police came to pick up the four remaining men, none of whom were injured. After parachuting out of a flaming plane, how can anyone have such presence of mind? Although it's undeniably hot, we have to light a fire every other day to burn our vegetable peelings and garbage. We can't throw anything into trash cans. Because the warehouse employees might see it, one small act of carelessness, and we're done for. All college students are being asked to sign an official statement to the effect that they sympathize with the Germans and approve of the new order. Eighty percent have decided to obey the dictates of their conscience, but the penalty will be severe. Any student refusing to sign will be sent to a German labor camp. What's to become of the youth of our country if they've all got to do hard labor in Germany? Last night the guns were making so much noise that mother shut the window. I was in Pim's bed. Suddenly, right above our heads, we heard Mrs. Van Dien leap up, as if she'd been bitten by Moshe. This was followed by a loud boom, which sounded as if a firebomb had landed beside my bed. Lights, lights! I screamed. Pim switched on the light. I expected the room to burst into flames any minute. Nothing happened. We all rushed upstairs to see what was going on. Mr. and Mrs. Van D had seen a red glow through the open window, and he thought there was a fire nearby. While she was certain our house was ablaze, Mrs. Van D was already standing beside her bed with her knees knocking when the boom came. Do so stayed upstairs to smoke a cigarette, and we crawled back into bed. Less than fifteen minutes later, the shooting started again. Mrs. Fandy sprang out of bed and went downstairs to Dusso's room to seek the comfort she was unable to find with her spouse. Dusso welcomed her with the words, "Come into my bed, my child." He burst into peals of laughter, and the roar of the guns bothered us no more. Our fears had all been swept away. Yours, Anne. Ersatz. Ersatz. Adjective of a product. Made or used as a substitute, typically an inferior one for something else.